Torah is done away with. Yeah. Can you, do you remember the days that that statement actually made sense? That the Torah was nailed to an execution stake and that we are free from the bondage of the Torah, of the law, which, by the way, is the worst possible, maybe the worst possible translation that you could come forth with of the word Torah. That's not what it means. It means instructions. It means instructions in righteousness. So the Torah done away with. What would a society look like if there were no laws? What would a society look like if evil was called good, good was called evil, those that were trying to uphold a level of righteousness were called the, the, the evil ones, the traitors, and those that were trying to go forth with some kind of anarchy, those were the heroes of society. Wow, that sounds kind of like the news today, does it not? Is it possible that we're living the fruit of what has been preached in churches for centuries now? That in the United States, or as I refer to it now, the divided states of America, in other countries that have bought into the demonic theology. And yes, I will stand with those words. The demonic theology. Talked with, uh, I was talking with Barry about this recently. Second Thessalonians. Go and read the verses regarding the evil one. The, uh, the, the man of, of perdition. Hasatan himself. That even in the times of Shaul in Thessalonica, there was a work that was at that time secret. It was behind the scenes to take away the Torah. Now we see the fruit of that. And for, as I said, centuries, this concept in Christianity of the, the, the law has been done away with, that was the seed. And now today, we are living out in our society the fruit of what that tree has produced. Well, you and I know that the Torah has not been done away with. It is being restored to us. Well, it's not that it need to be restored because the Torah was never broke. We need to be restored to the Torah. The rules, the instructions, instructions for righteousness, the express will of Hashem unto mankind. And so we enter into this week's Torah portion of Mishpatim, or rulings. Well, you know, th this is not normally the place that you would get really excited about. This is going to be like the rules, the, the do's and don'ts. But what is it about the instructions of righteousness that we should get excited about? That, you know, in... Uh, not too long, we're going to be over in Leviticus. Wow, yes, that's where we really get the rules, right? But the rule, as is the case with the names of yud heh vav -Hey, of the Creator, of the Almighty, His names are a revelation of Him. The rules, the regulations, the judgments, the verdicts, the way of life that he is giving to us through the Torah is also a revelation of who he is. And we begin this week in uh, Exodus chapter 21. These are the rulings you are to present to the Hebrews. It begins, the, the verse there in Hebrew, if we were to look at it in Hebrew text, begins with a vav. So, you know, this disconnect, we've got so many disconnects in Scripture. The Old Testament, New Testament, totally erroneous words regarding Scripture. If there's anything on the list of things that we should get rid of in our lives is the words old and new and the word testament. Because none of the three of those words are biblically based regarding what is in this book that we read. It is the, we could look at it as the Tanakh, 
We can look at it as the, the Hebrew scriptures, the apostolic writings, the gospels, but it's not disconnected. It's all together as one. We go from there to, you know, chapter breaks. Well, this happened then, then a chapter, you know, which is the, this chapter has nothing to do with that chapter because there's a chapter break. Then we have verse breaks. Then we have the Torah portions. Folks, it is a continual stream. The scripture is like a river that is flowing from one place to another. It, it does not stop at any place. A river does not just, you know, unless there's some divine intervention, uh, you know, like the Reed Sea or something, but a river doesn't stop and then pause and, you know, maybe a half mile down, it, it just starts again. No, it is a continuous flow, and that is what the scripture is. So this chapter 21, verse 1, begins with a vav, which is the connector, which is telling us that that which you have read in the ten words is connected to the judgments, the regulations we could say it like this. This is how you are to live out the ten words. Okay. Ongoing conversation. The rules, regulations, instructions are an ongoing conversation between the creator and his creation. An ongoing revelation that is brought forth through the ongoing conversation. And it begins in an interesting place with, if you were to take a Hebrew slave. Th this had to raise some eyebrows in that day. It is only a couple of months, uh, actually probably a little less than that, that they are, have come out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. And now they're free, but the scripture is telling you, if you take a Hebrew slave then this is how you are to treat that Hebrew slave. Now, let's take a spin on this teaching that maybe it's not about the Hebrew slave, but it's about the mentality of the Hebrew that needs to be changed, and it is going to be changed through the illustration of how you are to treat let's put it into modern terminology, a worker. If you have a company and you have an employee, this would be, we have this, you know, slave, slavery, especially in America today, various other places. It's, it's, a, it's a hot topic and, and word that brings forth a lot of emotion and is really not the, the essence, I don't believe, of what this scriptural, this, this verse is bringing forth. So let's put it into modern uh, terminology. If you are in a, a place of employing people and you sign a contract with your employees, the contract is that for X amount of years, you are going to work for me and here's the terms of that which is going, you are going to be doing, this is what I am going to be doing. At the end of that contract, then, well, you're free to go, but you say, I, I really like it here. The, this, the, your, the employee, the worker says, I really like it here. I don't want to go anywhere. And so I'd like to not just extend my contract for another period of time, but I would like to make our contract eternal, a covenant relationship of entering into a new position and a new relationship within this place of employment. But could it be totally a different reason that we see this? Let's look at the scenario. Two months earlier, there's a Pharaoh. Now, it is doubtful that that Pharaoh ever went into the land of Goshen and, you know, shook hands with all the people and got to know them. Okay, you got that? It's doubtful 
that he was just, you know, wandering around Egypt all the time and, and uh, enjoying himself. No, he was in a, a palace. He was protected. He was uh, to the point beyond even probably, you know, what we would say a president or, or the king and queen of England or something like that. So this is, the, the Pharaoh in that day is an unseen figure. And the only relationship that they have, the Hebrews have with the Pharaoh, is what is portrayed to them through the taskmasters. For that it is the taskmasters that they are seeing, we're seeing on a daily basis. And this is the interaction that they were, that they were having. The taskmaster was a representative of the Pharaoh. And so what is their opinion of the Pharaoh? It is through the filter of the taskmasters. Now, two months later, they've seen the taskmasters, the armies of Egypt, and some of them possibly for the first time in their lives, saw Pharaoh as he's laying dead on the shore of the Reed Sea. And now we enter into another place. They come to, the Mount, to Mount Sinai. Moshe is here as a representative. Okay, listen carefully. Moshe is here as a representative of an unseen Elohim. They had been told in Egypt that the Pharaoh in the palace, the one that they never saw, was a God, was an El, an Elohim. So now they're in the, at Mount Sinai and Moshe is the representative going up and down Mount Sinai and bringing this message from this Elohim that says, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. Okay. Is it possible, though, that their mind has not been transformed, but they are seeing Moshe as they saw the taskmasters in Egypt. And they are seeing the unknown or the revelation that they have of this unknown Elohim that has brought them out of Egypt is still kind of fuzzy because they see him as just another, just like another Pharaoh. It's a conversation I had with some folks this, uh, a couple of, I think it was this past weekend, regarding the word father. I've, I've taught on this numerous times, but uh, very briefly, when we bring forth the word father into our lives, as, as it is in my case, it, it's a little, some things just don't quite add up, you know? Because our earthly father was maybe there was some things done that were just should not have been done and now we can take that same uh that same attitude and portray that onto our heavenly father i've stated it like this the image you have of your earthly father may be how you're treating your heavenly father until some of those memories come to a place of healing. Moving on. The Hebrew slave, the idea of the servant that when his time comes to be released from the house, doesn't want to go anywhere because he has seen that this 
master that he has, this employer that he has, is not just about himself, but is a caring employer. I'm going to use that word because it doesn't have all the emotion there, or it probably still has some. This employer is so caring about his workers that are within his house that nobody wants to leave. Nobody wants to go anywhere. And so there is, there's a mindset change that is happening. Don't look at, you know, it is possible that, you know, someone was in a servant, uh, was servant to one master who was an evil taskmaster as Pharaoh. And then they come to a new house. It, it's the, it, it's the, the puppy and the pound syndrome. Okay, I, this is maybe the best way to, to put this. The puppy in the pound that is, is there all excited that there's a new person coming. You know, tails wagging. Somebody's paying attention to me. And then you go, you sign the adoption papers, you pay a few dollars, you know, and you take the puppy home. But then somewhere along the way, you make a move. You, you know, you didn't do it on purpose, but maybe, you know, maybe you have a magazine somewhere and, and you pick up a magazine and all of a sudden the puppy goes and runs under the table. And, and you're thinking, what in the world did I do? You don't know that the previous owner of the puppy, every time that that puppy did something wrong or even kind of wrong, had a magazine taken and beaten it half to death. And so the puppy associates you with the previous owner through the magazine. It's a mindset change that has to happen. This is what the story is. And this employee comes to the end of his contract. He's had children along the way. He's, he's gotten married. You know, all kinds of things have happened. And, but he's free of the contract. And he says, I, I don't want to go anywhere. I just assume, you know, my, my wife, my children, we're, we're, we're happy here. Okay, so what happens? He is taken to the doorpost of the house. And this would be the, uh, I believe, the, the, the doorpost, the door, or the doorpost, the entrance to the house. Not just kind of a random doorpost in the house, you know, maybe the, let's go over to where the bathroom is or something. No, this is the, the doorpost, the entry into the house, which there's... Uh, Numerous teachings out there about the, the, it's called the threshold covenant of entering into a person's house is a, is in a manner of entering into covenant with them. I, I understand this a little bit more in depth, having lived in a Mormon community, um, it was, it was great. The, the folks were great, but they had some things that at first, I didn't understand, and one of those is that the person that had built the house that we lived, that we bought, was not Mormon. But being in a Mormon community, had had um, had built it to Mormon specifications, which is that there was a kind of like a, a meeting room. You walked into the house, but there was like a meeting room prior to entering into the house. And I know that's not true with all you know, sects of Mormonism, there's, there's many, but it is with some that a person that's a non-Mormon is only allowed to enter into a certain area of your house. This was what was true in the neighborhood that, in the city, the town that I lived in. So you, he would have taken the, uh, the, 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 the employee, the worker, the whatever you want to call him, taken him to the doorpost. And put his ear on the doorpost and would have taken an awl and would have pierced the ear with the awl. Now, this doesn't sound real exciting to me. Um, you know, I've never really, never had a thought of having earrings. Uh, numerous reasons. One of them is 
I'm not really into pain. Not even a little bit. Okay? I just don't like it. So why should I endure something like that? All right? I, I just don't need to. But this is a different story. <laughs> then this is not a uh, th this is not an instance for the uh, the ongoing debate on earrings. Okay? This is totally different. So he would have taken the 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 servant, taken him to the door, door ear upon the 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 doorpost, and would have pierced his ear. Now, what would happen with this? Uh, with the it, what would have happened when the when the uh, uh, all goes through the ear? What's your body filled with? Okay, unless you're like one of those alien lizards that's, you know, part of the conspiracies of the day. Uh, yeah, shouldn't have gone there, but sometimes. Uh, it, blood would flow out, right? So you'd have blood that would come out and would be on the doorpost. Well, if we think back to Exodus chapter 12 and, you know, that Torah portion of, of Bo and the the, what was done? The, the blood of the Passover lamb was placed upon the doorpost. So the blood of the Passover lamb is to, this was still in their mind. And now they're thinking that, okay, here's this servant. This blood is going to be put on the doorpost. What's, what's the connection? It is connected. That the servant is now entering into the covenant of the house. And the covenant of the house is based upon the blood that was placed on the doorpost of the house. The servant has now entered into covenant with the house. Is no longer, should I go there? is no longer the foreigner of the in the house, but is now the foreigner who has joined themselves to the house. The servant is no longer a stranger of the house, but is now entering into full rights of the house. So you and I are like that servant that we, we, you know, we, we go to an altar, whatever, whatever you do. And, you know, you start to read the scripture and there's, there's, I was just reading this morning about the, the parable of the seeds. Some are sown on, on rocky ground and, you know, some don't produce anything and the birds of the air and, all of these things, look at it in, in the book of Matthew. There are people that want to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm entering into the covenant, but then, you know, something happens. Hey, I, it's a little too much for me. I'm out of here. Contract over. But then there's others that say, no, I, I see where true freedom is. My freedom is not outside this house. My freedom is inside this house. Here's my ear. Get the all. I want my blood connected to the blood on that doorpost. The blood of the Passover lamb, in my thinking, okay, the, the blood would have been dried. Okay, I know this is past the time of Egypt and everything. This is the picture, though, is that our blood mingles with his blood on the doorpost of the house. Oh, yeah, we can go on there a little ways, but I'm going to move on. Chapter 21, chapter 22. How, how do we sum this thing up, okay? Uh, to me, it's very, very simple. It comes down to pretty much one statement. Take responsibility for your life. Okay, where you're at in life is not always someone else's fault. Take responsibility. Now I know that there's things that happen to us that are 
seeming out of control, our control, and things happen along the way. But I, I find that it's not normally the things that are out of my control that mess me up as much as the things that are in my control that mess me up. Things that you look back and say, that was a bad decision. It sounded good at the time, but that was not really the best decision I could have made because maybe it was done with emotion. Maybe, you know, I got my feelings ahead of my sense or something like this. And th this, this Torah portion to me is all about this, this message of let's take responsibility for our own lives. If your health is bad, it's not the fork's fault. Okay? If, if, you're, if you're driving down the road at, you know, 100 miles an hour and get into an accident, don't blame the speedometer. Take responsibility for our own actions. We're going to see more of this in, Le, in the book of Leviticus, and I'll get into that more along the way. One of the verses, though, I want to go to is in, uh, we're going to go all the way to um, uh, chapter 23. Uh, no, I want to back up. I got, yeah, I got plenty. I got enough time here, I think. Um, uh, let's, let's see here. Um, hmm. Yeah, if someone, the verse 13, 14, depending on your translation of chapter 22, uh, and I've taught on this so many times, I'm just going to do it briefly. If someone borrows something from his neighbor and it gets injured, or dies with the owner not present, make restitution. Okay, if the owner was present, he need you, he need not make good for the loss. If the owner hired it out, the loss is covered by the hiring fee. All right, now I go down to the to the rental place here in in uh, in Franklin, and I get a tiller in in you know in the spring. I'm going to sign a contract. Okay, now. If I buy the optional insurance for that tiller and it breaks while it's in my possession, hey, it's in the contract. I paid extra for this so that if something happened, you know, that, that was our agreement. But now let's say that before I leave, I say, you know, I'd like to, to uh, you know, could you crank that up? I just want to make sure. You know, it's early in the season. I just want to make sure that everything's working properly. So the guy reaches over. You've signed the contract. Okay? The guy reaches over. He's got a little gas in it, and he pulls the, the, the thing, and it starts right up, and all of a sudden, boom, it explodes. Am I responsible? No, because I'm still in the presence of the owner of that item, even if I didn't get the optional insurance. But now if I get home and, you know, pull the cord and it cranks up and goes boom, I can't go back and say, uh, you know, I mean, it, it went boom. And I'm not responding. No, the contract is going to state that if it is, it, if anything is, is, is damaged in your presence, hey, what is that? It's this verse. Hey, put in there whatever you want. Hey, sewing machine. Somebody borrows your car, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, that this is just good common sense, which is not real common in our day, don't you, don't you think? Okay, uh, chapter 23, favorite verse, one of favorite verses is, do not follow the crowd when it does what is wrong. Well, they were, yeah, they were. Who are they to begin with? I, I've never met, met they. Uh, you know, today, they are the scientists. The scientists that tell us, don't wear one mask, wear you know, 14. Um, who are these people that are making these decisions? Who are these people that are, that are saying, well, this day, this is, you know, on this day, we shouldn't do this, but on this day, it's okay, but now next week, it's something different. Uh, this is the same day they that are teaching that we came from a slime pond. 
that there was a you know explosion somewhere, the Big Bang, and uh, all of a sudden you know two molecules got together and that became a slime pond, and and out of that a frog came out and wind started blowing over the warts and that produced ears and next thing you know uh, you know here's a monkey and then a man uh, they make men into monkeys all the time and they're still doing it <laughs> they're still doing it folks just go to walmart and look at what's coming in and out of the parking lot okay uh think for yourself this is what this verse is saying. Don't follow the crowd. Think for yourself. Take responsibility for your own actions. Not political, but think back to October 6th. Okay, this, this whole stupidity that's coming forth. I know that the whole thing was staged. I'll probably get taken off. I, I, I think I got dropped uh, in... in Canada the other day for something I said, but uh, you know who knows. Uh, think about all this stuff that happened. I mean, I know it was staged. Many of you know it was staged. The the people that that you know were doing the violence. The, these were many of them were paid actors. Th this was all put together up front for a purpose. But here's people that were there peacefully, you know, constitutional right, and, you know, doors are opened, and they're, they're told, hey, come on in. I, I listened to interviews with some of them that said, no, 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 we're not doing that. And guess what? They walked off because they didn't, do, they didn't follow the crowd. And today they're not in trouble. But those that just... Oh, wow, that sounds like a great thing to do. Yeah, what's their life like today? Moving on. Um, kind of obscure verse, but it says in uh, chapter 23, verse 5, If you see the donkey which belongs to someone who hates you lying down, helpless under its load, you're not to pass him by, but go and help him free it. Well, we probably don't have a lot of donkeys around, or I used to, but uh, it's just not something that, you know, we see on a daily basis. But um, maybe we could put in here if if you, um, you know, see someone with a broken down on the side of the road. And, of course, today you kind of wonder, but um, is there a di deeper meaning? Let's go over to Matthew. Oh, that's a great place to go. Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to find something out about this verse. That, see, when the Torah is done away with, or at least you have an opinion that the Torah is done away with, then you don't have a foundation to base things on and can come to wrong conclusions. Well, let's look at this in uh, Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to go to verse um, 46. It says, at about three in the afternoon, Yeshua uttered a loud cry, Eli, Eli. Um, yeah. Um, somebody, yeah, I can't pronounce that. Uh, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? So here's the theology. That, that Yeshua is upon an execution stake. And that the Father is looking down from the heavens, and Yeshua utters these words, and so the Father sees the sin that has been placed upon Yeshua, but then like, and I've actually heard this, okay, this is, I'm not making this up, I've actually heard this, that the Father turned around in the process of turning, he turned away, turned his back on Yeshua, and then turned back to him, and in that moment of time, all the sin was gone. Well, I, I, I just, there's some things about that that just don't make a lot of sense to me. Well, let's see if the scripture would give us a little bit more insight onto what is going on here. 
And this is a direct quote from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, um, getting over there. Psalm 22, verse 2 or 1, depending on translation. Uh, my Elohim, my Elohim, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from helping me, so far from my anguished cries? These are the words he's quoting upon an execution stake. Well, if we looked at the Hebrew words here, it's, why have you not loosened my bands? Would be a, another translation for it. The wording here goes back to this verse. So, the, some of the last words of Yeshua upon an execution stake, he's still teaching us about the Torah and the words that he's, that he's portraying into the heavenly realm is this. A donkey is released from his burdens. How long before I'm released from mine? That's what Leviticus is showing us right there. Now, verse 14, I gotta, I gotta move forward here. Um, we're starting, we're going down to, yeah, verse 14. Three times a year you are to observe the festivals for me. You go to Israel. Well, that'd be great. Uh, most of us eh, have a little hard time, uh, to, you know, affording three plane tickets per year. One is, is difficult enough. But right now, the airport's closed to begin with, so you can't go to Israel. But I guess the, the, the verse just means nothing then. We just kind of, you know, highlight it with a black magic marker and move on, right? Well, what if instead of doing that, we decided, I'm going to do something that is to the best of my ability today in order to try to observe the spirit of these instructions, even though I cannot observe the letter of these instructions. I, I had someone the other day, a new partner, uh, or new, they, never mind, it just somebody called and uh, ma making an a automatic donation, which we really do appreciate those. I mean, we appreciate all of them, but you know, when we can kind of plan on a monthly basis, it's really nice. So they, they gave me a, a credit card information, uh, permission to, uh, to take out a certain amount every month until you know, they get mad at me or something. Um, hopefully that won't happen. But uh, they said, also, and also, would you make a note that three times a year, during the time of the festivals of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, we'd like to take you to take out X number of dollars extra in that month and send that offering to Israel. That's when, the, when, the, when Yeshua says the Father is looking for those that would worship in spirit and in truth. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that person got it. They got the, the essence of that. So here's my challenge to you. March is, is coming up, okay? We've got Passover is coming up. It's coming up pretty fast on us, actually, uh, just over a month from now. I want to challenge you to beginning this festival season of Pesach to find some way to send, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, okay? Just whatever it is. Maybe, maybe you don't have but 10 bucks. Okay, I got that. Maybe you can do much more than that. But I challenge you to beginning this Pesach, find a way to send an offering to Israel. Now, there's all kinds of different ways. I've got numerous ones. You can call us, you know, call our, uh, our, our phone number. You can give us a credit card. Uh, you can send a check. Any, any, I've said this so many times, any money. And right now, folks, there's great need. 
There's great need in Israel, and nobody's talking about it, or very few are talking about it, except unless you, you know, turn on late night TV and give to organizations that are, uh, you know, paying for those advertisements. Just saying. Um, there's a lot of need in Israel right now. One hundred percent. Whatever comes in for Israel goes to Israel. In some way, one one form or another, we get it to Israel in some way. Okay, it goes to some some place that I trust, the people I know, to get the money in the right place. I just put that out to you. There should not be a single person. I'm not asking for money for us. Okay, I'm thankful that there's people that understand that without a ministry that's solvent we have no way to go forth and do the work that we do. With that being said, there should not be a single person that is listening to me today that is not thinking, I need to make a mental note, I need to write it on my bathroom mirror, I need to do whatever it takes, but this year, I'm going to begin this practice of sending something to Israel. Now, if you want a little bit more on that, go to Romans. I'm not going to read the verses, but get your pen out, okay? I want you to read. Where's Romans? Still in this book, yes. To the right of Acts. I love it when I just turn there, but that doesn't happen most of the time. Look at Romans chapter 15, okay? And start reading at verse 25. Okay? 25, 26, and 27. You read those verses. And then go back to Leviticus and make a decision to walk in those verses. All right. Chapter 24. A few more minutes here. They make this statement. We, now I say Vanishma. Uh, Barry Phillips has done a beautiful song on this. Um, we will do and we will hear is the way that this reads out. We will do and we will hear. Now, I say vanishma. This is totally opposite to the way that you and I normally operate in life. That I want to understand something before I do something. I'm a why person. Okay? I, I like to, you tell me to do something and I want you to tell me, okay, now why should I do this? And that's fine when we're working on an earthly realm between two people. But it's not fine when we are operating in a spiritual realm between us and our creator that our, and th this goes back to the, to the word hineni, here I am. It's a, it's a no strings attached. It's not the, you know, hineni does not mean uh, what do you want. Your, your wife calls you, yes, honey, what do you want? No, it's, it's, it's whatever you need, the answer is yes. I just need to know what the, answer, what the question actually is right now. Um, with this verse comes the, the rabbinic Hebraic uh, statement of through doing comes understanding. The, the best example for that, and I can't get there because I'm wired here. Yeah, I can. Okay. Excuse me just a second. I'll be right back. <laughs> that wasn't too far away. This is the first prayer shawl that I bought. This was back in 1997, I believe it was. Um, I read the verses, and it said that you were to put a blue thread in the corners of your garment. I looked at the prayer shawl, and, and I okay, and I, I bought one. And I, actually, I bought this one. I can't remember if I bought this one in Israel or not. But I, I, I got it, and it had white threads on the zitziot. So I'm thinking... Um, no, it says put a blue thread. 
So I checked, and this is in the first days of the, the rediscovery of the, the snail and all these things that are going on. And so you could order uh, blue threads in that day. It was $150 for four threads, and there was a six-month waiting list. Ah, uh, well, I guess we just throw the commandment out. You know, it doesn't mean anything today. And I didn't do that. So I, I started looking at this, and I thought, you know, if I got four of them here on this Talit, um, I can take one apart. And this is, you know, 1997, there's not really anything on the web. Uh, there was one guy I knew that had a sheet of paper that had some information on it. And so I went down, I took one apart, I went down to Walmart, and I bought blue thread. Okay, I got this, this royal blue thread right here. You can't see it because I got a blue shirt on. There, it's somewhere... Somewhere there. There you go. You can see it there. So I bought this blue thread and I took one apart and I tied it back together with the blue thread. Uh, then I did the second one and the third one and the fourth one. And I still have the same prayer shawl. Right here. Um, I, I did not understand much. I didn't mean to crumple that up like that. That was kind of rude. Um, disrespectful. But I did not understand much about the prayer shawl in that day. I had some limited uh, revelation about it. But I understood that it was supposed to have a blue thread. Today, I can teach probably for an hour and a half on that piece of cloth and on, those blue th on the threads and what they mean. I can take you through scripture in various places. This, this is not about me, but that's the essence of through doing comes understanding. If you're waiting to, to do, if you're waiting to understand everything before you do it, I dare say you're never going to do it. Tomorrow never comes. The, the revelation, you'll always find a way to get around I need to do this today until you decide maybe if I begin to do something then that will be the key to the revelation to come. Okay, moving on, one last point. Moshe, Aaron, Nadav, Avinihu, 70 of the leaders went up and they saw the Elohim of Israel. I mean, take Take a few moments this Shabbat and read the, the rest of these verses. They, they saw Elohim uh, under his feet was something like sapphire stone pavement as clear as the sky itself. He did not reach out his hand against the notables of Israel. On the contrary, they saw Elohim even as they were eating and drinking. What, were they, what was this about? They were having a covenant meal. They were having a covenant meal with the Elohim of Israel, the creator of the universe. A question for you. Who were they eating with? Who, were the, who was it that was seated at the table that they were eating at? Well, I'm working on a message. It'll be released next month. But I am going to put forth the statement that they saw. They saw a manifestation called Yeshua in that day. Oh, wow. Well. Okay. I, I'm just going to leave you with that one to, to carry you on through some ideas of your own on this Shabbat. Think about that when you sit down for a covenant meal. Shavuot Tov, Shabbat Shalom, or reverse order there, I guess. Uh, have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem, God willing. See you again next week. Until then, be strong. <laughs> Ya er Adonai panabelecha 
Shalom.